Hi, I'm Coach MK, founder of the Fitness Protection Program. I'm a run coach, not a life coach. But we're never really talking about the running. Running is the tool. It's the conduit we use to examine the world we live in, as well as its impact on our own lives and the lives of the people around us. How we react to certain people and to certain stories tells us a lot about how we view ourselves. I'm committed to the thoughtful, intentional exploration of the importance of running so that no one discounts their own badassery, ever. Final note, this podcast is geared towards every runner who won't lose their home, livelihood, or health insurance if they show up to the corral with a hangover. Not that I'm encouraging you to do that, just saying. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the Fitness Protection Podcast. Ask the coach, 728. Yes. How is it 728 already? <gasps> 7, July 28th? What? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's like this year. Nine weeks till race day. Nine weeks. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, that just kind of, you just blew my mind a little bit. Mm. I know I've got 14 weeks till the New York City Marathon and... I have no idea how that's going to go. I'm like, I'm trying not even to think to to not think about it that much because I just went for my third post surgery run early this morning, and I'm Yay, 20 minutes in. I'm like, I'm good. It just takes so long. It does to get it all back. I mean, like we spent too much time yesterday talking about. Well, we filmed a new uh, fitness protection podcast about the collective responses, a very strong visceral responses to the Beyonce video that a lot of people did not recognize was actually an advertisement for a service called 22 Days. And I remember there's a point in Homecoming that is not reflected really in this short uh, advertisement. And it's how she felt in her first day. So she gets on the scale. You see that in the video. And then in the Netflix special, you see her there trying to go through the steps and being like, oh God, oh, day one of Coachella rehearsals. And then she's like, what have I done? What if I can't pull this off? And you kind of watch her have a moment. There's yeah. nothing she can't do. And like what she has taken on is just so huge. That is kind of how I felt this morning. Like 20 minutes in, I'm like, guys, <laughs> I got to walk. I'm sorry. My heart rate was fine. My pace was normal. My body was just like, um, you got to break this puppy back in. I'm like, oh no, I'm sorry. It was not <laughs> fun. So that is where I'm at. How about you? Oh my God. Like if they need to see my braids. They need to see my braids. Everyone needs to see Coach Raz's braids. She actually had me take them out this morning. So her hair was this like amazing sort of kinky mess and it was great and I loved it. And I remembered when I was a kid and my friends and I would braid each other's hair like when it was wet so that we would wake up the next morning and take out the braids so that they would be all like kind of kinky from the braids. Oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. That was my, my my best, best, best friend, Gabby, who was also my friend that I first ran with ever. I used to do that for her hair. And she like she was like, will you braid my hair, please? And I just had this amazing flashback to, to braiding her hair to make it look like that post-braid, you know, wave. Roz had her for her post-braid wave this morning. We had an amazing day. We spent almost the entire day outside and I am exhausted. Who does this? Oh my God. Get me back right. inside to the air conditioning, please. At least you have air conditioning to come back inside too. Yes. Let me I'm tell so you. lucky. Oh my God. Ours went out like, I, I'm actually, I'm not sure when it went out. So the roofers came yesterday and I think the system got overheated. Like they might've had tarp over it or something so that bits didn't fall in it. I was like, why is it so hot in here? It was like 82 degrees. And oh my God. God. We were opening the windows. We were opening the doors. I'm really grateful for the $600 worth of fans that I got on Prime Day that I'd been so worried about. I'm like, well, now these, these are just the geniusest idea ever. Thank you, universe, for justifying this purchase. But it was just really, really uncomfortably hot. So my husband took the kids out while I tried to do all the strength videos today while sweating through... As, as little clothing as I can get away with wearing. That's a long way of saying you said air conditioning and that is a trigger word for me right now. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Didn't mean to trigger you. <laughs> you didn't know. <laughs> good. But you say you didn't get to watch the video, the Facebook Live. So someone tagged me in one of those Facebook games. And I understand that most people hate those Facebook games. I kind of love them. Because when it comes down to the people I know best, if I think about probably my two best friends in the world, if you were to ask me... What on the surface seems like a really basic question, what's their favorite color? I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, like, what's the most meaningful moment in their life? I'm like, uh, I could guess, but I'm probably going to be wrong. You kind of like the behind the scenes. I kind of like all the behind the scenes. And I kind of like those questions about like, you know, 15 facts about my mother. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Like you took the time to ask your mother those questions. I don't know. I just feel like they're not terrible. I've decided to use this as a, an opportunity to talk about my ADHD. I was diagnosed when I was 12 and I resisted medication until I was almost 30 because I didn't want all the stigma that came along with it. By the time I was finally at a point where it's like, okay, we need to talk about medication because this is out of control and it's going to affect your adult life in ways that you can't undo. I was just like, but it's going to nullify anything I ever do at the same time. It'll always be something that's that's weaponized or used against me, used to discredit me. Oh, well, she's taking this academic super drug. You know, when you don't actually have ADHD, that stuff wears off and it's really terrible for you. If you do have it, it's like just a miracle drug. I can't begin to tell you. It's just like, I understand now what normal is and what it feels like and it's so, so terrific. So I've been using this to sort of come out about that because it's one of the very few remaining things. After going public about my rape, I'm just kind of like, okay, what else is there? Not very much, but this is definitely on that list. So I'm on day four of the day seven, like seven days, take a picture of something, no, no people, whatever challenge. And I've been trying to show the tools of management that I use to corral my adult ADHD. And the one I did right before we started this live stream, I talk about how in the ADHD mind, everything is connected in a way that's tough to articulate. So I'll start talking about something and people will just sit and look at me like, because they just have no idea where I'm going with that. Because my brain kind of like works in circles. And the tangent always comes back. But if you stop me while I'm on the tangent, I'm going to forget where I'm going. And then I'm going to be low-key pissed. And you're going to be low-key pissed because it's like, what were you talking about? That had nothing to do with anything. And I'm like, because you kept interrupting me. But the few people who kind of get me that are close enough to get like these phone calls will sit there silently until the circle closes. And it's a cool moment for me and it's a cool moment for them. And even if they hate it, they still answer the phone. So, Because <laughs> the other thing is, but I love about phone calls, they end. Every introvert finger quotes, introvert that really hates interaction so much, we'll send 75 fucking text messages in a row with no end in sight rather than do a three-minute phone call. And I'm like, I get it. That's a quirk. But I again, the ADHD person, 75 text messages from what I can't... I'm like, mm-mm, mm-mm. It stresses yeah. me out. But what's funny is that I was giving direct examples of this in this live stream that I just did downstairs. And I tell a story about how I got this random text the other night from someone that saw something nasty that happened to me in a large group of people somewhere I used to work a long time ago. And no one stood up for me in that moment. And I was, you know, really like, I was pissed about that for a really long time. And this person reached out after seeing the live stream and we're not Facebook friends and was like, by the way, I know the instant you were talking about, I was there. You might not remember me, but I'm really sorry I didn't speak up, but I take Adderall too. And I was afraid they'd come for me next. So I didn't say anything. Wow. Oh and I was God. like, whoa, thank you. I mean, are you a piece of crap? A little bit, but you don't have more social clout than I do per se or more privilege per se. So I'm not going to hold it against you. Like we're good. Thank you. I am, you know, I hope your life doesn't suck. Mine doesn't either. Neither one of us belonged in that job. So that was such just an incredible moment. It made me think of something equally terrible that had happened recently to someone that I love very dearly, very good friend of mine to Tamara. And I, the second that I got this text, I'm like, I, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I've got, I've got to talk to Tamara. And I'm just, I'm in my head, I'm laying out the thread. And this is what this text has to do with Tamara. Like Tamara, I just want you to know this thing that happened to you, someone saw it. Lots of people saw it. And they might not say that you're right because they don't feel powerful enough, but they know, they know that you got screwed. They saw it too. And maybe I hope you don't have to wait 15 years to get your text, but your text is going to come. I know you feel alone right now, but you were seen. So the punchline to this story is that I never actually made that call. I forgot. Oh, man. <laughs> and I realized it as I was wrapping up the live stream. Uh, yeah, that... Well, <laughs> and this is why I, I am I'm thinking about going back on medication because I'm like, now I've got too much going on. And just thinking about unwrapping the thread feels like a memory because I made the connection. It must have already happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get that. And I get, and I remember actually being super reluctant to like get into the whole texting thing when everyone started doing it because I hated the exchanges that never ended. They stressed me out too. And I eventually just caved because... 
I was the only like friend of all the friends who wasn't texting with everyone. And like, that's how people were making plans now. And I just had to either like get on board or not be included. But, but I remember feeling that stress. So I, mm-hmm. I, I really relate to that a lot. Whenever you call me and we have to have a conversation about something, it's always better than trying to do it over text. It was, it's always the right thing to do to call me. And I'm always glad when you did. Oh my God. And anytime like you can't take it, I will just leave a seven minute voicemail that you can look at disregard. (laughs) I did not listen to that voicemail. It broke the inbox and I will never be offended by that. (laughs) Seriously, it doesn't. And I've talked to people before who get really... I mean, this is a problem in one of my previous roles. The the job I had directly after business school, like in multiple people, they were like, did you get my voicemail? And I'm like, I see they called while I'm on a call. I call them right back. Right. And they're like... So did you get my voicemail? I'm like, my dad, that's no. like my dad. My dad always gives me grief for that. He's like, well, I left a message. All the details are in the message. Okay, dad. I'm just, I moved but so I'm calling quickly. you back. <laughs> right? So and, here I, I moved, am. <laughs> I moved so quickly that, no, I didn't stop to see even that I had a voicemail because I've got 17 voicemails. <laughs> and while, while I'm listening to my voicemail, I'm getting more voicemail. It's, it was such a stressful thing. I just gave up and stopped. If someone called me, I would just look at the call log and call them back one after the other. I got so many calls in that job. It was, it was, I mean, it was terrific, except that there were just so many of them. Every, no one wanted to put anything in writing. They all wanted to talk on the phone. Anyway, it was a very different environment, but like that, not listening to voicemail got me in trouble in the past. So if that's conditioned in you, just know it's never going to happen here. If you don't listen to that voicemail, if you just saw that I call and comment back, that is cool. You know, I, what I like, you leave the voicemail, but I call you back as the voicemail is like telling me that it's there. So I never even knew that it was there. And then you end up telling me whatever the thing was. So I'm like, okay, I don't need to listen to that. But then like three weeks later, I'm like, oh, I still never listened to that voicemail. And I listened to it and you're like so full of energy and like, hey, hey, I just want to tell you, I think this is amazing. And it, it has something to do with something that happened three weeks ago. But, but I get to just experience all that affirmation all over again. And so I really treasure your voicemails. Even when I don't listen to them right away, they... Thank you. They, they're I really great. That. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Everybody just has a different way of doing things. And yeah. it's become really cool to be like de facto, this is the superior method. And I'm like, there is no superior method. Like I, it, I, I, I define... So I'm as, like, like I just described, I'm a circular thinker. And when I'm with other people that who I know also have ADHD or in, whether they're medicated or not, it's sort of like, they know what I'm talking about immediately. I'm a circle person. I'm a tangent closer if you don't stop me versus I just go off on tangents and at some point you have to interrupt or you'll never get to say anything. So there, there's circle people and the line people. And if the circle person is talking to a circle person, we each sit there with a notebook. And if you say something that makes me have a response, I'll just take a, a quick note of what I want to say and let you close the circle. And then once that circle's closed, we'll come back to it. Like you did just now, let me tell that whole story and then coming back to voicemail. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's like once you can just kind of know how to interact with another person and be like, okay, cool. And roll with it versus like, oh, they don't communicate the way I want to. There's something wrong with them. That's just, that's just stupid. It's, 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 it's demeaning and unnecessary. You miss a lot if you kind of insist that people only communicate with you on your own terms. There's, yeah. Yeah. And my phone calls never go as long as my live streams. It's usually like, Hey, okay. <laughs> This is just too much to type. It's probably going to confuse you. X, Y, and Z. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Got it? Cool. Bye. Speaking of bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, we have a lot of questions tonight. Probably <sighs> right. of those. Yay. I shared a document with you if you want to pull it up and look at it. But I'm going to read this first question to you anyway. We already agreed. So should we, should we go for it? Let's go for it. For those of you that are just joining, my name is Coach MK and you are listening to Coach Sarah as well. We are the coaches and the founders of the Fitness Protection Program, which was designed for every runner who is not going to lose their home, health insurance, or salary if they show up to the corral with a hangover, though we don't advise it. This is our weekly segment where we take the questions from all of our clients and our programs maintain, rebuild, and soon to be build, runner interrupted, and the strength beta. If those sound good, get on the mailing list or email us at info at Coach and will put you on the list to be notified when those go live. This is part of that suite of programs, $30 a month auto-renewing subscription. You ask the questions, we give you answers. You may consume the live stream as a video later. At your leisure, they're all uploaded to YouTube. This will also be converted into a podcast, again, that you can consume at your leisure. Transcripts forthcoming later when we have a little more money to spend. We do not have those yet if you're currently working with us and need the transcripts a little bit faster due to a visual or auditory disability, do let us know at info at coastandlove.com. 
So question one, yay. This is, so by the way, we're starting with maintain questions tonight. Maintain is our group of runners who have a base of fitness that they would like to maintain. And people, people in maintain are kind of all over the place in terms of where they're at, in terms of, you know, the extent to which they are doing all of the runs as written because they're looking to do a marathon this fall. There's a lot of variability in this group and I really, really like it. And it's great. So question one and maintain. This is this is a big question, but I think it's actually a really good way to, to kick our discussion off tonight. So I'm not sure if this is more of a podcast question or an ask the coach question or just random thoughts. All of the above. But I'm thinking a lot lately about being socialized not to take up mental, emotional, or physical space. Coach Sarah Ooh. wants to interject and say, you and me both. I only did one year of organized sports as a kid and it was soccer. I was in first and second grade and small, playing with boys one or two years older, and I had undiagnosed asthma. Oh, and then I did a year of cross country in sixth grade, also small, and was so slow that I came in dead last every practice and every meet. So far, last, I almost missed the bus once. Ugh. So you can imagine what that did to my self possessed of potential. I relate very, very much. And if you listened to last week's Fitness Protection Podcast episode about cheating, you probably heard my story about um, straight up not going to swim practice anymore. This is Coach Sarah talking because it made me feel so terrible because I was so dead last all the time. I so relate to this. And you know what? This is why parents need to really think twice before forcing their kids to do something they're bad at and just sit there season after season. One season of humiliation and learning how to deal with it is plenty. Like there comes a point where trying to teach your kid humility, you're just punching them in the face. Yeah. And that if, if you wouldn't do that, then some of something like this chant them out. But sorry, go on. So this is not to ask for pity, just to provide context. For the last three races I've signed up for, I've backed out really early in the training. I'm self-sabotaging in the way that Sam Dillon Finch talks about fawning in relationships. The thought mm-hmm. of competing is almost too much mental burden to comprehend. The thought of coming in last only reinforces the lessons learned from childhood. But I can't believe the lesson here is don't compete, don't race, don't try. I just think I never really learned how to be aggressive, assertive, taking up space confidently in spaces outside of a precisely defined academic setting because some of those carry this weight too. How does that urge to compete urge to give myself permission to best someone else, the subverted or suppressed urge, how does it relate to the body conversation we are having? What are the right small steps to take to stop trying to shrink physically, fit in emotionally, erase myself athletically while still running? I'm 44 and I want to give myself permission to be really angry and fight on behalf of myself. In my head, I think to compete, I need to have perfect preparation to have a right to participate or any chance of success, also apparently personally undefined. And I don't think that's right either but I don't have any idea how to start unpacking all of this besides obviously talking to my therapist about it. And I thought I'd come to my favorite coaches because I do think it's part of this larger conversation. Small steps are the key to get from sedentary to rockstar fitness. Small steps are the key to get from poor nutrition to nurturing yourself. What are the small steps to get from doubting a right to take up space in a race to pushing yourself hard and being badass? I heard you take a deep breath. Yeah. I love everything about this question. Like you are a great writer. First of all, you articulate this so well. You're saying things that I'm like nodding really, really hard at and thinking, yeah, man, I get this. I get this really hard. And I feel like, I don't think I'm here right now, but I have been here. I've definitely, definitely been here and really struggled with like, well, why would I even do a race when I'm so traumatized by the idea of running a time that's slower than I think is okay for some arbitrary reason? Yeah, I just, whew, I feel you and I love you. And I, I really want MK to say stuff now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. This really resonates with me on multiple levels simultaneously. So when I think about parts of me that are classic ADHD, one of them is that my husband, who is a classically trained physicist, uh, refers to it. He's like, you're like gas. You consume all of the space where you are. And the first time he said this to me was in a hotel room where went into to unpack. I don't ever, by the way, again, ADHD, this is there are lots of learned behaviors that to go against my best instincts. I don't put things in drawers. If it's not if it's not out, if I can't see it, I'm gonna forget it. And I have moved and left stuff in closets <laughs> only to have the next inhabitant to be like, Do, are you missing something? And I'm like, no, what? Oh, all my clothes, thank you. <laughs> and it's been a running joke for a while. So but when uh, the first time we went to a friend's wedding together, we tried 
traveled together in, in we were in Toronto and I just had my stuff spread out all over the floor. And he's like, well, you just guess you consume all the space you're in. And that was our first conversation about ADHD. And this is what I have to do. And by the way, this is orderly. So if this really bothers you, then we need to rethink a whole lot of things. And it was just never an issue again. He was like, oh, okay, that's it. And it was the first time I'd ever given a reason. And the person I was with said, oh, okay, and moved on. And that's when I knew that I was definitely going to marry this person. And that ties in, in my mind, to this story or to this question about permission to take up space. That was literally the first time I'd been given permission to take up physical space that my mind literally required. And I totally understand and see it now that I'm a parent. I thought it was just a product of being Southern, but I'm coming to understand that this is everywhere. To go along to get along, don't say anything, don't rock the boat, don't draw attention to yourself. Be there, be pleasant, be pleasant enough that people are happier there, but not so pleasant that you're asking for attention. Don't try to be the center of attention. If you are the center of attention, you can't enjoy it too much, but you need just enough attention that people got to notice you. And it's all these conflicting messages and hard to tell people where to stand and how to navigate all of this. So it's no wonder that fawning has to happen because we got to live in this world. And it's hard to live in this world and be mad at this world for sending all these mixed messages to you, for depriving you of validation and for teaching everyone else that the ideal of politeness is to not help when you clearly need it. So when I think about some of my, again, when I'm thinking, I'm thinking about one of my, one of my best friends, um, her wife is pretty senior at the craft analytics group. They know cool people and they do cool things in the sports industry. And occasionally we will talk and she'll mention an event or invite me to something. And I'm kind of like, you know, I just don't see myself. She's like, but you train people for like races and finish times and stuff. I'm like, yeah, but I train some competitive runners for sure. But there's a difference. My bread and butter is not competition. And when I think of sports, I think of sports as competition. Anything that is not a competition in my mind is not less than. Competition is just a very specific niche of a much larger thing when it comes to running. Mm -hmm. And the thought of competing for most of us, I think is too much. Again, for a lot of those same crosshairs that we stand in, like whenever it's become really cool to make derogatory comments about participation ribbons or participation trophies. And I'm like, are you pissed that you didn't get one? Like, what, what is it you're mad at? Are you mad at this situation? If you think that the message is being missed, let's talk about how all of the lessons that they're getting are reinforced by only giving the MVP trophy out. Like being there is one thing, but the only person who really matters is the person who's getting the trophy. That is the Harry Potter type of thinking, the hierarchical thinking that we're, that we have been struggling to get away from when it comes to our children, where only the best matters. Like the beginning of that book uh, by Sean Acor, where it talks about everybody at Harvard, they're not happy just to be in the constellation. You've got to be the brightest star in the constellation or you risk depression. No one knows how to just be in the constellation. So that is true on a younger level in sports and on an older level in so many parts of your life when you realize I might never be the brightest star in the sky. How do I hang in the sky? No one has ever, ever told me. So if that's where you are, let me validate you. I'm no wonder you're confused. And you've been conditioned to not take up space and that's going to work for you and that's going to be good. But people can't give you credit for work that they don't know you're doing. They can't help you if you aren't asking and they still might not which is not to say if you haven't gotten help is because you didn't ask correctly. That is not true either. The, the point is this, we're finally at a time where we are being encouraged to make ourselves seen and make ourselves heard and to really make a difference to respond to that when we see it. So in those moments, the first little step that I would take is a familiar hashtag with a very different meaning. Me too. Me too. Me too. When you walk into the corral at the race day, me too. I belong here. When you go into a run store and everybody in there is like a whippet and you're like, whoa, I don't look like that. Me too. I buy shoes too. I matter too. Mm -hmm. Remember the time that I went in after I'd just given birth to RJ, I was quite large. I hadn't lost the baby weight yet. And I walked into a run store and was ignored. And then someone tried to show me Walker shoes and I got pissed and I went to my car and I cried and I put on my bun huggers. I got in my minivan and I pulled out my bun huggers and I went back in with my belly hanging out and my booty hanging out. And I was like, you will serve me. And I spent two hours in this run store and I made them serve me. I think they thought if they would just move, they would be nicer. I was I was going to make sure they never did this to another person. I'm sure they probably just quit. But the, my point is this, after that moment, what was left to be afraid of? Yeah, That was what I needed to do 
to take back my power. Now, I'm not saying everybody goes need to be doing what I do. I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. But there is no should. Like do or do not, there is no should. But it kind of starts with showing up to something you want to do and saying me too. Competing is not better. Having that competitive mindset is not better. What we're supposed to get out of team sports is learning how to work with the team towards a common goal. And that, I postulate, is very rarely taught. It's about the supporting players rotating around the MVP, making sure he gets the trophy and being good with never getting one. And I don't see how in the world that's good for anyone, especially women. So to that end, there's nothing wrong with you. There's something very wrong with the forces that have shaped you. You are the product of that environment. Hate the game, not the player. The player in this metaphor is you. Give yourself permission to be angry. Be really angry. It's terrible. It's trash. It's garbage that you are here, a fully functioning adult who's come through so much to be where you are. To still feel less than and undeserving, that's because you're not getting validation where you seek it. That's one of the things that I aim to provide to everyone who wants it and to show you what you do deserve. It is possible to get and encourage you to make those little changes day by day, reclaiming your time, reclaiming your space finding joy in that, helping you work towards a common goal with other people around you that are having the same feelings that you are and remembering it all starts by lacing up your shoes and in those moments where you feel like an imposter saying to yourself, me too, I deserve this. There's a gif of Megan Rapino at the parade in New York where she's got these fabulous glasses on right after they won um, the, the World Cup this most recently. And she's kind of like sw- swaying back and forth. I deserve this. I would say between me too and I deserve this. Practice both of those and channel me and your inner Megan and say me too because you do. I would like to add to that. The, the mantra I recorded on Friday was kind of about this because I know that a lot of people don't like to run at the track for this exact reason. They don't feel like they belong there. They don't feel like their work is worthy of that space. They don't feel like they can take up the space because there are faster people who are going to pass them and that's not okay. And I'm like, no, you know what? It is okay. If they need to pass you, they can fucking pass you and it is fine. And like, that is not an inconvenience to them. That is how sharing space works. You are there to work. Your work is not less. If they need to pass you, they will pass you. And guess what? I run the track twice a week. I am always the slowest person there. And I run in fucking lane one. I am there to work and I'm running in lane one and they can pass. They need to pass me and they don't get like, they're not mad about it. No, that's just the way you share space. So there are rules to the track. If you're going to run on the track, learn the rules of etiquette to the track. But once you, and once you follow the rules of etiquette to the track, you totally belong there. It's the people who don't that are problematic. Oh my gosh. Real quick. This morning I went to do that terrible midnight sun workout on the track. And there was a woman who was walking against traffic. So she was walking clockwise in lane one. She was walking against traffic in lane one. And then she kept drifting like across all of the lanes. And I was like, I am so angry about this. What are you doing? This, that is not how you use the track. And then I was like, you know what? She is doing her best. Whatever she's here to do, she's here to do something. And like, I will be fine. But this is not actually going to hurt me in any way. Sundays, the track isn't that crowded anyway. So, and close parenthesis. You belong there. You deserve to be there. But there are rules of etiquette. Learn them and know that not everyone is going to know them. Mm -hmm. And it's usually the people that are yelling the loudest that are the least familiar. Mm -hmm. They just happen to run track in high school Mm -hmm. and we'll tell you about it. So, Mm -hmm. and no offense to track in high school. It's just sort of, it's it's a language few people speak. But that you you belong there and you belong in that race if that race is where you want to be. And there are a lot of people in any given race situation who are not there to compete. They are there to do something. They're there to do something that is their own. But no one there is going to think that you are lesser for taking up space, but not being there to compete with others, if that makes sense. Oh, God. And I'll I'll close on this story and then we probably need to move on to other questions. Remember the story of the very first marathon I ever ran. I came, I finished, I went home to my my dorm room and I cried my eyes out to my roommate. He was like, what happened? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. They They were so mad at me and I made them wait an hour. I finished an hour behind them and they just, all I know is they had to wait an hour for me and they're so mad and I don't know if I can run with them anymore. And she's like, well, what was your finish time? I was like, it's like a 323 or something. And she's like, oh, is that really? that's really bad then I guess for a marathon and I'm like I guess I don't know so I want that to be like if you remember nothing else from this I did not think I could call myself a real runner until I broke three hours in the marathon and it turns out that run club 
they were still trying to qualify for the Olympic trials. Context matters. That was the bullshit stick I beat myself with for almost a decade. It's one of the reasons I didn't like want to buy a bib. I thought it was less than because it didn't have my name on it. I didn't think I belonged there if I had to buy a bib that I was like cheating somehow to show up. You can make up whatever parameter and say, well, if I was here, then I would belong. I promise you, once you get over that hurdle, you still won't feel like you belong. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the life. I lose a few, if I lose five more pounds, I'll be more confident. People will be nicer to me and I'll finally get that promotion at work. It's like, nope, nope. Then there'll be some other reason that those things don't happen. It was never really about the weight. Whatever it is you're feeling right now, that imposter syndrome, it really doesn't have to do with that. Stay in therapy, keep talking about it, keep thinking about it, and just know this, whatever you are thinking and feeling right now is no different than a Mary Catherine Brooks crying in her dorm at Georgetown because she ran a 323 marathon and was too embarrassed to show her face again. I almost quit running. Oh my God. Yeah. But it's not their job to make me feel better. Nobody knew anything about marathons back then. We didn't have Google. I'm old. Remember? My tiger stripes appeared that I will never cover up because aging is a gift given to very few. Why would I hide it? Yay, my gift. But that was also, (laughs) that was my shame for almost a decade. I did not, I would not have perspective on how fast I used to be until I moved back to the United States in 2007. So all that to say that was bollocks, which you feel is valid and real and created, but the stick by which you have measured yourself and found yourself wanting, that is bollocks too. Stick with your therapist, keep working out, say whatever you have to say to get up and get started each day. But is recognizing the patterns is the first step to overcoming them. And now that you recognize the pattern of fawning and self-sabotaging, you are that much more likely to eliminate it. Yeah. So uh, do you want me to read the next question? Go ahead. All right. I know we beat summer running to death, but can you talk a little bit about shuffling, walking at whatever snail pace is necessary to keep a heart rate low versus running at 155? What's better? Should we do whatever it takes to stay under 140? Or is it better to get out there and get moving even if a higher heart rate is higher than it should be because it's 90 degrees at 5 a.m. and humid A. If. I just want to start out by saying I feel you and it's really, really, really hard. I'm going to give my impressions and then I'm going to let MK rule on this as well because she is much better versed in the science. It sort of depends on a couple of things. One, if, if this is an easy effort run of under an hour, then we like to see you do what it takes to keep under 140. If you really want to call that an easy effort run, you're going to have a hard time convincing us that it was an easy effort run if your heart rate is above 140 in that first hour. If we're talking about a long run, then and we encourage you to stay under 140 for that first hour. Do what it takes. The, my last couple of long runs, I have really intentionally kept things super slow in the first hour and then tried to maintain even effort going forward. And usually yeah. that will mean that your heart rate will rise a little bit. But after the first hour, we're not really too worried about that. We want your effort level staying even. We want to see your pace not increase. If your pace is increasing, then you're, then you're kind of cheating that a little bit. Don't let your pace increase. <laughs> You know, kind of stay stay where you are in terms of effort and pace if you're paying attention to that, but don't pay attention to it just for the sake of this. And then at that point, worry less about your heart rate. Is that pretty accurate? I would say it's perfectly accurate. And But if you are so demoralized at that pace that you can't get out, and I, if it's 90 degrees at 5 a.m., I can completely understand that. If you're getting on the treadmill, summer, it's going to be better in a few weeks. And being on the treadmill is not a lesser thing if it keeps no. you more happy and more motivated and you have yes. air conditioning, un- unlike what I have in my... I mean, I'm just sitting here here and I can't begin to tell you how uncomfortable I am. So I can't imagine if I was like outside running with no air conditioning, you know, if going inside is is a thing and an option, I'd say exercise that option because frankly, anything is better than going much more slowly than you want to go in total heat and total humidity at a time of the morning that really isn't convenient for very many people. That's a whole lot of things you might not like concurrently. If we can take even one or two off the list, get rid of the heat and the humidity and get on a treadmill at five in the morning, that's better than than five sucky things simultaneously. When you read articles, if you were to Google this, what's better, the articles are all going to be giving you information based off of critical power thresholds that matter more, to be perfectly honest. And this does not mean you're lesser. This is not better. But when it comes to an elite runner, a Molly Huddle, if you saw, she defended her 1500 meter title at nationals yesterday. It was a really big deal. Woo, Molly Huddle! Amazing. I love but her. She, most of us get to know knew her for winning the New York City Half Marathon. So the way that she goes back and forth between 1500 meter, which is a little bit shorter than a mile and being really dominant at the half marathon is a concept of critical power. And she needs more of it for a shorter distance. She needs less of it for a longer distance. So if you're a Molly Huddle, this is a very different question with a very different answer and a very different set of implications because 
when she goes out there to run. It's not about just her best, but it's her best versus everyone else's best on a day. That's what competition is in running. And that's not what we're doing really in training. We're more like Julie. Julie just ran 100K in Vermont. Did you see the stats? I posted on her Facebook page earlier this week. The stats are in what the, the DNF numbers Staggering. were. Staggering. Like it's it's roughly 50%. Roughly 50% of the people who started the race finished it. And she was one of them. And she was out there. She was like, I could have kept going. I was strong. It was terrible. It was really hot. I didn't want to be there, but I could do it. So there's something to be said for time on your feet because one thing she had that a lot of runners don't, a lot of ultra runners that I see that don't spend enough time on their feet is those critical adaptations that make running possible. So even though I know you might not yet see the value in having your body weight centered over your ankles with forward locomotion, like anything forward is forward as long as you are on top of your ankles. Like that doesn't sound right because we're so used to thinking and faster is better. More is more because it isn't less because we're Americans and that's everywhere and there's no getting away from it. But when it comes to the endurance game, it's just not true. Walking has a lot of benefits that don't need to be overlooked. But if it makes you miserable, then we need to get you a little bit faster than we need to get. We're going to have to get you inside at least temporarily. So there are always real trade-offs, but I'm not really worried about it. What's better is whatever you hate less and is less likely to overtrain you. And if you're going out every day at 5 a.m., there's a big difference between 140 and 155. My fear is you're going to be overtrained pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Next question. Okay. Starting the on-ramp in a week, which means I have 11 weeks until my marathon. Insert minor freak out here. Okay. Now I'm better. (laughs) I hear you on that. (laughs) But I like to talk about food. I would like to fuel with real food, not gels or blocks. As I age, I'm finding I have lots more food intolerances. Have either you, Coach Sarah, Coach MK, have much experience with fueling with homemade or real food alternatives? Thanks to both of you. Me? No. And I know that sounds awful. The first time I tried goo was at a Nike run in 2010 <laughs> in New York City. It did not end well. We were all running for the bathroom. All Everybody in my, in, that, in my run cohort, none of us had ever taken it before. And it just the the reaction immediately, like within 30 minutes, all of us just like, can we get arrested for pooping in Central Park? I mean, when's the have you heard of that happening to a runner? It was a really big deal. So I have been doing this for so long. I don't like running with food in my stomach and I don't feel during a race. My nutrition and my fueling is the code for the way I eat in general. Because what happens before race day matters a whole lot more than what you do on race day. And the things that I have known people to fuel with that have seemed apropos for a marathon range from the honey packets that you could get at Starbucks uh, to the salt packets that you could get at McDonald's. Beyond that, I don't really do that during marathons. So if you want to answer, feel free, Coach Sarah. I mean, because we know I, we know now that part of the reason why I can do that for years and years and years was back that now I have celiac. I was diagnosed in 2006. And most everything has some sort of gluten in it or the sugar content is so high that at those effort levels, it's going to give you GI distress and it's going to make you sick. It was designed for cyclists that were going up like mountains or for uh, you know endurance athletes. So if you think it's going to take you six, seven, eight hours to do the marathon, for sure. I hear gels have come a long way. I just have not personally used them. And I also feel uncomfortable giving nutrition advice because I'm not a nutritionist. I would like to co-sign on that last thing. I am also not a nutritionist and do not feel super comfortable giving nutrition advice. To answer your question in a really simple way, I have tried homemade real food alternatives to a limited extent. I've basically, I've tried different recipes for like basically Larabar adjacent type things made with dates and nuts, some combination of thereof. I make them at home, tried a few different recipes. The Run Fast Eat Slow Cook book has a couple of recipes, I believe, or maybe it's the sequel to that one. I don't know. Oh, is it those superhero muffins that they have in there? Oh, I've made a, I I made five dozen of those last weekends, but I do not use those during my runs. No. Um, I've heard some people have like little bites. Those actually, I mean, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I really like those by the way. And I have a horrendous amount of zucchini in my house right now because we have a CSA in the summertime. We actually have a CSA all year. And in the summertime, we get hella zucchini for like six weeks. So so last weekend, I made five dozen superhero muffins and I've never tried to eat them on a run, but I could see how it might not suck. Not knowing anything more about your food intolerances though, I'm hesitant to like, I, you know, something specifically that works for me might not work for you. But I also though, I tend to be on the MK side of things in the sense that I do not eat very much. I don't eat before runs. I don't really eat on long runs unless I'm testing something to see if I can carry it on race day just in 
case I need something. And, and on race day, I really, I, you know, I have a couple of my, you know, little like energy balls or whatever it is I decide to make. And again, they're basically Lara bars that I just make at home. Lara bars being those that you can buy them in pretty much any grocery store. And they're kind of just made with dates and nuts and other, uh, other things that give them different flavors. And they're pretty good. They're fine. You know, if I'm testing something to carry with me as a security blanket in a race, just that it kind of like gives me the knowledge that like, okay, if I really need something, I have it. But I am so used to running for long periods of time without anything in my stomach. And I really don't like the feeling of running with anything in my stomach because I suffer from heartburn a lot. And I have for many, many years and having food in my stomach just exacerbates that. So I, I think all of this is to say that this is a really highly individualized thing. And of course, I know tons of people that <laughs> wear by homemade and real food ways of fueling during running. And there are lots of different things you could try. I would start with Shalane Flanagan and Elise Kopecky's cookbooks. They have great stuff in there, great suggestions. Just I, I really love their nutritional philosophy overall. They're very much in favor of like having lots of different kinds of foods, having lots of fats and lots of, you know, really kind of nutritious and, and calorie dense foods in your diet if you're a runner. And I think that's really important to have that be kind of a core principle of how you eat as a distance runner. Yeah. Because um, by the time I show up, I don't need anything on the day because of what I've done the preceding two weeks. Exactly. Yes. And I also try to um, put myself in that same situation. Next one. You should probably ask me this one. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I was going to ask you this one. Seeing yeah. everyone's race plans is giving me a serious case of FOMO, but I know with some nagging injuries, it's much smarter to take it easy this fall and focus on building slowly and getting strong AF. Can you talk a little about being okay with not racing for longer periods, a year or two? I mean, it's okay to not be okay. That's the first thing. Where we go wrong is focusing on the distance between where we are and where we want to be and trying to cut it down too quickly. Some things are just going to take time. And I know that sounds pithy and it's like the last thing that we want to hear because we we hate that distance so much. We would do anything to cut it down. But just about anything we can do to cut it down is actually going to extend it and make it longer. So with that, think about what it is that you love about racing. Like, I mean, I know what I love this time of year. I love toe socks and I love, you know, having new shoes to try. And I love wearing slightly longer sleeve shirts. And I like feeling colder when I get started and like being covered in sweat when I finish. And I like the materials changing. Like there's a shift in the air and a shift in my attitude. There's a part of me that will always come alive in the fall. I guess I'm a flower that blooms uh, in September and in October. And if that happens to be who you are as well, I feel you. But if we can't be participating in the race, then we can still be tethered to a lot of the things that we love. If you live in a city with a bigger organization like New York Roadrunners, they need volunteers. HERA, the Houston Area Roadrunners Association, they have a lot of volunteer opportunities and they are easily the second best running organization I have ever been involved with outside of New York City. So that's another opportunity. Look where you are and look for the RRCA and certified running uh, groups. They probably put on your local races, if not your local marriage. Marathon, start there and start volunteering. It's not secondary to be part of the experience. Don't think of it as like, you know, penance. Like if I do this, then the universe will, will reward me by cutting down my time. If anything, go there and just remember that reframe your attitude towards it. There's not going to be bargaining anything away, but think about what it is you love and let's try to get some of it instead of a second best. A second best is never going to taste as sweet, but if the excitement is being part of it, volunteer at the start corral, volunteer at the finish line, find a bigger race. Like I'll be running New York, the New York City Marathon later this fall, whether I'm ready or not. I know several people will as well. We're probably going to have a meetup around that time. If you've got nothing better to do, come to New York and volunteer with the New York Road Runners or if that sounds terrible to you. And I promise it's not like there are really cool things you can do. My husband, um, his company, they volunteer every year with Project Achilles and they help the athletes with disabilities cross the finish line, put their gear on, get their bags, put on their medals and, uh, and get them out of the park. And that's a really cool experience to have too. There's some way to be part of the triumph of the day. Pick one and travel for it. And I'll buy you dinner if it's in New York. And I'll congratulate you on, on being there and being part of this, even though this isn't what you intended in the first place. We can find ways to make it at least an experience, even if it isn't the experience that you wanted to have. I love that answer. That's so great. I, I have nothing to add to that. 
I should probably take the next one too, since you don't know, yep. the, you don't yep. know the answer. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. That this is this is a you project here. If we're looking at doing the strength beta in September, I know we're supposed to get series in August, but how critical is the long run distance in that equation? Ballpark minimum go. Well, it depends. It depends on what you want to do at the end of it and what you want to do afterwards. So if you are like hardcore, I got a race because I can't do anything like this for eight weeks and be on lockdown without racing at the end of it, then we, we need to keep the long run in there. If you think you might want to run a marathon later this fall, because the long runs, by the way, are not going to be any longer than what you're already doing and maintain. They the are long not runs in be- the strength beta, you mean? Correct. Yeah. Correct. It's not going to look exactly like what is going on in maintain, but the weekdays will look like the time suck, the net total workout time. It'll be mm-hmm. less running, more other stuff that I can't really talk about yet. And mm-hmm. Net, net, it won't be, it won't be more. The long runs, again, net, net, it won't be more, but the intensity will be different. Okay. So how important are the long runs? They're important, but the, we're distance runners. We're endurance athletes. Even if we don't think of ourselves as athletes, we are in fact endurance athletes and we have to keep the long run minimum 95 minutes in the equation with the occasional long run at up to two hours and 15 minutes. If we want to be ready to participate and potentially give race level effort to to a half marathon distance at the drop of a hat. Mm, cool. All right. I'm going to ask good. you the next one too. <laughs> okay. I'm running the Rimacon relay. I hope I'm saying that right. On yep. August 24th, as part of an ultra team, total of 25 miles on the low end. How should I modify and maintain to incorporate a taper to be ready? And when can I jump back on the plan? I'll be participating in strength beta. So I still want to be ready for that as well. Thanks. Okay. The rule of thumb for ultra runners, they don't taper. And I know that sounds odd because there's this fixed notion and our mind that a taper is it's two weeks for the half, it's two weeks for the full. So it must be like four weeks for the ultra or minimum two. And it's like, no, it's not true. Elite marathoners, because of that critical power threshold figure, which diminishes really quickly, their taper on average is like, realistically, they're cutting training volume and but not the intensity. So when we say taper, that matches what they do. It's about four days long. And that's about what it is to an ultra runner too. Yeah. So to taper for this, I've probably given a template before. It's like 40 minutes of one by one on a Monday with 10 minute warm up, 10 minute cool down, a stride sandwich about 46 minutes long on Tuesday, Wednesday, a total 30 minute, 10 minute warm up, 10 minute cool down, 10 minutes of one by one in the middle, Thursday, like a 20 minute practicing race pace, and then nothing on Friday. And then you would start your run on Saturday. Cut one day off of that, cut the 20 minute off of that if the race starts on Friday. And I think you're good to go. That's all I would do for a taper. And the one that you're reaching for in the one by one is roughly the fastest race effort that you would expect to need to find during the course of your Rimicon segments. And I know that's very convoluted sounding. In something like that, it's not like a consistent uh, effort level like it would be in a road race. So just pick the part that's going to be like the hardest or the fastest or the, or the worstest and then replicate that over and over and over in the in the one by one. It's not like a, a taper week in an ultra. We think of it more like a race week. Mm-hmm. Race week. It's- yeah. I mean, I, I've seen the way these ultra runners go now and it seems like their whole MO is like, I'm always a little tired, but I'm never really tired. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of where they operate at all times. So I have a lot of respect for it. It sounds perma hungry. Perma hungry. Perma hungry. All right. Um, I'll be participating in strength beta. So I still want to be ready for that as well. Are we all good with that? When can I jump back on the plan basically is, is the next question. But- oh, sorry. Um, so when you can jump back on the plan, it depends on kind of how you feel afterwards. Generally speaking, these things, you're not going to be, you know, it's, it's, I say three and a half days for every hour you spend at or above uh, race effort, which I define is 160, 165 and, and above. Um, broadly and generally speaking with something like this, you might find yourself not quite going that hard because you can't stay up there for, for, you know, that long. It gets harder and harder to go hard each time you stop and then restart Mm -hmm. in this ultra type of scenario. So I would say probably like minimum four days of nothing but walking. And then if you went, jump back in when you feel it. And I try to make it as easy as possible. The way that I would do it, let's say that this was most of these events are like they start on a, on a Friday afternoon and end on a 24 hours after that. Some of them, it starts on a, on a Saturday and then very few start on a Saturday and on a Sunday. All the ones I've ever done started on like Friday and on Saturday because of people got to travel. So to that end, and if I was doing a Friday to Saturday circle, I would make myself walk at least 20 minutes on Sunday. I would walk at least 20 minutes on Monday, 30 on Tuesday, 30 on Wednesday. If I felt like jogging on Thursday, 
I would be like, nope, Thursday's my rest day and, and do absolutely nothing. And then Friday, I would ask myself if I feel like running. If I do, 46 minutes dry sandwich. And then the next day, 75 minute vanilla long run. Sunday off, back on the plan on Monday. If I did not feel like running on Friday and thought one more day off is probably better because I've still got a little soreness behind my legs when I climb stairs, great. I would take the entire weekend off and start back on Monday. But here's the key. You got to recover. What happens is people feel bad about, about being still, like they're being lazy. So what they do is, well, I'm not running, so I can do that bike trail. Oh, I'm not running. You know, I'm just going to do this little gravel century, but it's a gravel century, so it's not really hard. And then there was a 14er, so I'm going to climb the 14er with two of my friends. And then the baby wanted to come and I couldn't say no. I had to put her in the backpack and carry her and it was terrible. And it's like, well, that's hard. I, this is why I don't take my kids anywhere. Like when I hike, I don't want to... <laughs> You know, like, cause then anyway, this is why I don't want to do Disney. Everybody's like, yeah, Disney's this magical place on earth. I'm like to carry four children. I got a bad back. Y'all know what we'll talk about it someday when they're like, they can push each other in the stroller or they can push me in the stroller. Like that'll be the day between now and then. No, that's my two cents. Especially if you want to do the strength ultra, then we just need to make sure that you are really ready to kind of hit the ground running. And if we, if that means you need to take a little more downtime, take a little more downtime. It's going to be okay. Yeah. I would rather you came a little more refreshed and a little more rested than a, a little overtrained because you thought you needed to do more to be ready. Does that make sense? You're ready or you're not. It's not really a question worth asking. Like you're ready. Um, the question will be, am I rested or am I not? That extra day or two isn't going to move the needle very much towards ready or, but it could move the needle much closer to overtrained. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense. All right. You can ask me the next one. I think I I know the answer. <laughs> when doing the workouts with 5K and 10K pace intervals, I've been using my most recent race paces for those distances, which is considerably faster than the formula of 140 pace minus three minutes. Sometimes if these paces do not feel doable, I will back off. But most of the time, I'm able to hit them. Am I doing myself a disservice training this way? My easy effort pace is about 14 minutes per mile, but 11 minutes per mile for a 5K effort does not feel difficult at all. I average an 842 at a 5K this spring, so that is the pace I typically use for those intervals. Of course, my heart rate is in the 170s to 180s during those intervals. I wasn't sure if there was an HR cap for the faster intervals. There is not. And no, you are not doing yourself a disservice training this way. The key thing that you said is sometimes these paces do not feel doable. I will back off. That's that's good. That That is a good instinct. And I'm glad that you do that. The formula of 140 pace minus three minutes, that's a starting point for a conversation that a lot of people don't have enough information to have. A lot of So, so a lot of people do not have a recent race pace for 5K and 10K both that they feel like represents their true... like. 5k or 10k effort. So we use 140 pace minus three minutes for 5k, 140 pace minus two minutes for 10k as a proxy to, to come up with a pace to aim for, for those intervals. However, Perfect. if you do have a recent race time and you averaged 842 to 5k this spring, go you use, use that pace. You're doing it right. Yay. Yay. 100%. I agree with absolutely everything that she said. The reason that differential would exist is called critical power. You're pretty strong. So you can generate a lot of power when you're running a 5K. That's great. That does translate and it will hopefully translate more because remember, your heart rate's in the 170s to 180s, but it is July. It is hot AF. It's humid AF. It, these Me are too, less than the optimal <laughs> conditions. So yeah. And the final piece is part of the reason that I had to have these proxies is that most people don't know how to race. I discovered really quickly when I started running near the middle or the back of quote unquote the pack of the race itself. I just roll my eyes at that. It's like, I'm a back of the packer like quit saying that it's not like like quit offering up that i'm a turtle like it, it you're not lesser because it, it is what it is like we're hobby joggers yay i don't assign this any more value in my life than, than i need to because it doesn't pay the bills yay me i adult so awesome but what it comes down to is that a lot of people i discovered did not in fact know how to race which 5k pace eight minute miles okay what's your 10k pace eight minute miles let me guess your marathon pace eight minute miles which your marathon pr 532 wait that's not eight minute miles yeah i know i'm really good until i mile 16 and then it all falls apart. And I'm like, okay, well, we can adjust those paces a little bit. Which most recent 5k pace? 27 minutes. That's not eight minute miles. Okay. We got work to do. So that's kind of where that comes from. And that's why I'm like, let's just start with these numbers because it takes a long time and a lot of practice to learn to run by feel. And I side eye any coach 
that disagrees with me on this because I feel like there's a disconnect between the runner who ran track in high school and who has been doing this for most of their life and the person who takes this up later in life. And plus your the what that effort level feels like changes as your fitness increases. And it can change really, really rapidly because there's this whole idea of neuromuscular connections. So like example, I went for a run this morning after being in bed for six weeks. At my, yay me, my usual easy effort pace for what it was right before the surgery was around 11 minute, 11, 11.30, something in there with heart rate around 140, but I couldn't hold it for very long. And it didn't catch up to me until about that 20 minute mark. And then it was like, whoa, okay, all by all of these metrics, I'm fine, but I don't feel fine. I need to walk because I've been in bed for a long time. My muscles, are, my muscles don't have this type of endurance yet. So my body was doing what it was used to doing because it, that, it was following its instinct, but my muscles and my tendons and my ligaments aren't able to keep up with those firing neurons right now. And that's what makes it hard coming back. That's why rebuild is so important. That's why rebuild exists. It seeks to leverage on that without topping you out and re-injuring you. So this has been a long and it feels like a winding answer, but I think all that information is really relevant and important. That's why we do things the way that we do. It's a good place to start. But if you have a relevant number, awesome, we go there. I have to operate if I'm going to have a big guided DIY program and do what I want to do with it. I have to assume that nobody truly knows how to run by feel. Everyone has too much mental strength and has been forcing their body through workouts that were harder, more brutal, and longer than they ever really needed to be for the event that they were signing up for. And they certainly weren't specific enough. And that really what we need to do is convince you guys to back off, go a little bit slower and develop, cultivate a range of paces and efforts when before you only had one. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. All right. Next question. I have trouble doing the supine plank on my elbows. Is there any problem if I do it up on my hands instead? Am I missing benefits with that difference in form? Nope. All I care about is that your booty's on and that you're not wearing your shoulders for earrings. Booty on, no shoulder earrings, and you're winning. What is the recommended time between races when following dedicated or tenacious, debating a half or a full approximately one month after my October race? I would always be careful with that because it really kind of depends on what you need to get out of the event. Um, Let's say the event in October, and I'm just going to make this up. Let's say the event in October is a half and you race the bollocks out of that half and it goes really, really well. And then you feel so good. You're like, ooh, California International is right around the corner. I'm pretty much almost ready for that. I could do that. I would be okay with you then turning around if this was like the beginning or middle of October and looking at California International because it's the second week of December. That's another enough time that you can recover, build up and go because our base is that high in here. However, if you're like, oh, I had a really good half marathon. I, now I can do MCM two weeks later. I'd be like, mm, yeah, no. If you were to be like, well, okay, that was really good. I bet I could go, but you know, there was wind in my face in the finish and I'm really frustrated. So I want to try to race again in two weeks. I'd be like, mm, better not. So I would really want minimum four, ideally six weeks in between half, like half marathon, full on race attempts. You can always show it to a half marathon and treat it like easy effort, like a long run. If mentally you're good with that, I think there's something to be said for doing that, for holding back and practicing, holding back and being okay with it. To that end, it's always going to depend, but the sort of six week minimum from between half marathon marathon attempts. I don't want you to get too greedy in a period where you feel good and end up getting injured because we ramped up too much or tried to cram too much into it. So if it was like, if you wanted to do two halves at race effort and a full between now and Christmas, I'd be like, "Mm, let's talk about mapping that out. So give me some dates. And I think I could answer that a little bit better because I'm afraid any rule that I give you is not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just also, I want to throw one more thing in there, which is be very, very careful with the idea of racing for fun. Like, oh, I'm just going to enter this race, but I don't care about the outcome. If if anyone says that to me, I'm going to push you a little bit on that. And because I'm not going to be convinced because it is hard and I personally cannot really do it. I have I'm one that always tries to talk people down from it. Right now, I've got an elite who I think is a little mad at me. Well, he's always mad and he's usually mad at me, but that's just how he is. It's fine. If he's not mad, I think that's when I worry. But he... um, (laughs) Throughout the idea of doing, um, there's a local race called Georgetown to Idaho Springs that is used to be the Olympic showcase when people would come here and train at altitude. And then at the end, before, at the end of the summer, race GTIS and then go back to wherever they came from because that's when all the training camps would sort of cultivate in that race and uh, culminate rather in that race. And so it still has, it's still a race that has a lot of meaning locally and it's really good. So if I'm like, yeah, I wish you wouldn't race it, people act like you, you called their baby ugly and then slap their mama. And I'm like, the problem isn't the race. The problem 
is what if it doesn't go well? Yeah. Um, the mental game is so big for these guys that if the race day doesn't go well, they just like the rest of us could be like, whoa, that rocked my world. I thought I was fitter than this. I thought I was readier than this. And now we've got like six weeks till race day. And you're questioning yourself, your ability and your training. And, and, and we can't have that. You can't afford that. So the question I always ask myself or enforce my athletes, my one-on-ones to ask themselves is, what if it doesn't go well? And you really rebound. Yes, I, everyone says like, yes, 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 it's the right answer, but it's not the true answer very often. And once we've had one event where I say, you sure, you sure, if this goes badly, can you handle it? Yeah, I'll be fine. And then you aren't fine. I will bring that up the next time mm-hmm. we're facing down the same vision matrix. Yeah. All right. This is our last maintain question. And then we still got four questions in rebuild. And I'm going to ask Ooh. you this one because this is very like specific to the training plan that you wrote. So I am going to ask you, Hey, Coach MK and Coach Sarah, short question. How many days do I need between my last long run and my race? Longer question with background info. It's KRMAs. I'm running hiking the Pikes Peak Ascent in four weeks, although it's only three, 30.3 miles only in quotes. I'm loosely using the marathon ramp plans for my long runs since I expect to take five plus hours to do it. Very smart. With crazy weekend schedules in my family, I decided to move my long runs to Tuesdays for the next month and maybe forever. So now I'm looking at my last long run being 10 days before my race instead of the 15 days before based on the usual ramp up schedule. Do I need to shorten the last long run to be less than four hours if it's just 10 days ahead of my race or keep it four hours or see what feels good on that day? Thanks for the answer and thanks for you all being you. Thank you. Good luck with that. That race is hard AF and it's going to be mostly a hike. So I would aim to keep it at four hours and we're going to treat this taper the same way that we would an ultra taper where we reduce the intensity, but not really the duration. Like we don't need the four hours. The race days was set when you entered the 10 week marathon ramp based on your fitness on that day. So if we need to cut the four hours down to like two, because life, because heat, because your, your gut's just not feeling it, that's totally fine. Like that hour and a half missed doesn't own your race, right? Your fitness level in aggregate absolutely does. So see what feels good on the day, plan for four hours, but give yourself some grace if four hours doesn't work out. Try not to worry too much about it, which I know is really hard to do. What matters is really the consistency much more than anything else. And if you don't believe that, go back and listen to the podcast, Happy Birthday Dear Susan, where we talked to Melissa Yakuzo, who showed up and managed to knock out 40 miles when earlier in the day she wasn't convinced she was um, uh, fit and ready enough to knock out a half marathon. Woo! Carrie, you're going to be awesome. I'm so excited for you. And I think this is the point where we transition over to rebuild. And we have four questions in rebuild. And the first one is a little bit long and I'm going to read it to you. And then I think the ones after that can be knocked out reasonably quickly. So let's just go right into it. Hi, I'm trying lane two this month, but I have not been as successful on it as I was in lane one. Successful meaning getting the greens and training peaks. I've only gotten two runs and no strength the last two weeks. If it matters, it was Monday and Saturday I completed. Reasons for it were work travel last week and lots of unforeseeable chaos this week. Does this mean that my life isn't ready for lane two? What does 75% of the work 90% of the time actually look like? Is that based on total time or number of workouts or what? I was planning on doing lane two again in August with the hope to move to maintain in September after school starts and kid bedtimes aren't so late and weather is cooling. Next week, I will try running in the morning since we're starting to get kid bedtime a little closer to school normal. My first response is like 75% of of the work 90% of the time, it can look like anything. And I know that's not probably the answer you want to hear. You want something very specific. It's X, Y, and Z. But really, it's like I'm getting most of it done. Yay, we're good. It does not sound like you're meeting that benchmark right now, which doesn't mean anything like there's no moral value on it. It just means that you are adulting like a boss. You're getting stuff done that no one can do but you. Congratulations on that. You're awesome. And I love having you in the fitness protection program. But we also need to make this a mental part of being fit is being mentally fit. I want you to let go of this idea of getting into maintain on September the 1st, which doesn't mean you can't. It just means, hey, you know what? July was hard. We're going to write it off. And the person who wrote this lives in a place where it is incredibly hot outside. Life's not easy. This is this says nothing about you other than how awesome you are, how tenacious you are, and how your priorities are absolutely in the right order. What we're going to do, cut yourself some slack. And who cares if you don't start maintaining on September the 1st, you're not disappointing anybody. So don't make up things, arbitrary benchmarks, and uh, those turn into bullshit sticks that we beat ourselves with. Don't, don't, don't do that to my girl. I'm too proud of you and you've come too far. If you spend an extra month in lane one, not the same as failing. If your life isn't ready for lane two, that does not mean that we can't do all of the things that you might be interested in doing around your birthday. We're going to 
celebrate hugely. You're not letting me down. You are by no means behind. If you want to go back to lane one for a month, that's okay. That's not failing. That's not backsliding. That's adulting. And you've been doing a whole lot of that lately. Don't stop now. I got you. And I know that you have a lot of stress in your life right now and you're dealing with it beautifully and you're still like traveling for work and parenting your kids and running a couple of times. Like you're awesome. I just want to say you're awesome. I know some of what you've been going through because you shared some of it with us and, and you're still here. You're still tethered to us and that's what matters. 100%. Okay. When should we carry water on runs? How long? Temperature? Never. I hate carrying water on runs. That's not true. Okay. (laughs) I hate it too. (laughs) I hate carrying water in my hands. I bought that Lululemon bladder and that is kind of the best money I've ever spent. So I read a write-up in Outdoor Magazine about it and I've been waiting for a day and a a run long enough that I can justify uh, pulling it out and putting it on. But because the way it fits is so different from all the others. You know, the flip side is it's so large that it's it's kind of hot. So when it's hot enough that I need water, it's so hot that I don't want to wear yeah. <laughs> the Lululemon carrier. I kind of digress. I, what I tend to do with, wa- with water is I stash it. I plan my long runs in advance that go by my friends' houses. And the night before, I'll take a frozen bottle of water and I'll stick it either in their mailbox or on their porch. And then when I go for my long run the next morning, it's usually hot enough in the summer that it'll at least mostly melt overnight. I get a g- couple good mouthfuls out of it, put it right back at and then go around and collect the water bottles again later that night. And I dump clothes too. So it's not unusual for my friends to come home from like, I don't know, church or softball and see like a big heap of clothes on the other front porch. And maybe I peed in their grass. Just kidding. I'm not done that yet. But <laughs> Roz probably did though. <laughs> you know, I, I've got Shiloh loved peeing in the rocks outside for the longest time. We couldn't get her to stop. And yes, I did oh, not. Thank I'm you so much for saying that because Roz loves peeing in the grass everywhere we go. And like, I'm really, it's like not everywhere we go, but like whenever we're in a park or somewhere. And I'm like, do we can't just do it. Like, I, I get it. I so get it. I always have to pee, but like, people are going to get mad at me. Okay. <laughs> Boy moms everywhere are like, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> she just wants to pop a squat. She does not care. <laughs> and I don't know what to do. Yeah. But this is very off topic. Um, oh, and, we, and we've got to grace. We've got to stay on topic. So we we've got to stay. No, no tangents. No tangents here. So, but but I think what the person is asking is like, at what point? Like, how long of a run? At what temperature? You know, should we carry water? And I don't think there's really a benchmark for that, right? I think it's like sort of your no. needs. The- I will. So I like to start my long runs at like four thirty or five in the morning when I'm fit. I'm not there yet. But part of the reason for that is that I want to get as much of it done before the sun comes out and I make the run harder than I have to for as long as I can. Because in Colorado, the when I'm in the sun, it's, even if it's like 60 degrees, it's going to feel like 80. So, And that can come later in the training cycle around October. So I will put that off for as long as possible. There's no reason to make myself sunburned and dehydrated and miserable in, in August when, quite frankly, October can be just as brutal around here in the sunshine. So um, my rule of thumb is that if at least midway through my run, it's going to be 80 degrees or higher, I stash water. It's only on my long runs because I always have water nearby on my shorter runs. Like I'm never that far from my car. I run either. And that's one of the reasons why I love running around Wash Park. And I I hear all the time, like, I don't understand how you don't get bored. I'm like, they got potties, they got water, and they got people. So if something happens, like it's got literally everything I need to succeed on my run, no matter what happens, why would I want to go anywhere else? I don't get bored. And that's why. So find something that means those needs that maybe you'd be a big loop near your car, which is basically what Wash Park is for me. And I've always got water in there. So the only time I have to like worry and plan about the water in advance is my long run personally. I don't know about you, Sarah. I hate carrying water. I'm like you. I also tend to run very, very, very early and I want to be mostly done by the time the sun is up. That is not really possible in the month of June. The month of June is brutal for that. It's starting to get a little bit better, staying darker a little bit later. But I tend to run where I know there's going to be at least one water found at a strategic point in and I make sure that I'm going to run by it a couple of times. And I'm lucky to have some options there. And if I didn't have options like that, then I would probably do like you. I would have I would have a car parked somewhere and I would stash water because I just, I hate carrying it. I've tried many different methods and I hate carrying it. There's no like, okay, if it's going to be X temperature and the run's going to be this long, then I'm definitely going to do it. It's, I, I kind of look at the forecast. I think like, okay, does that sound hot? Am I going to be, am I going to really hate myself if I don't plan ahead? And if there's even a maybe in there, then I do try to plan ahead with, with some water stops on my route. 
Perfect. Okay. You want to read me the next one? Yep. I am very afraid to run outside alone in the dark in the early mornings. I have no problem running alone in my neighborhood since once the sun is up, but cannot bring myself to do it in the dark. Usually early mornings are the only time I have to myself. Any strategies for running in the dark and feeling safe? Or am I better off sticking with the treadmill, which is my traditional go-to for 90% of the workouts? My pace and cadence feel much better on the occasion that I'm able to run outside and I'd like to be outdoors more often. Totally hear you. Um, and I, first of all, I, I am never going to say to any Anyone that like, well, you should get over it and run outside. Because no, if you're going to be afraid the whole time, don't be afraid the whole time. Run yeah. on the treadmill. However, I do hear what you're saying. You like running outside. I like running outside. I feel safer running in the dark when I am wearing 360 degree lights and I am lit up like a Christmas tree. And when I have really high, so I have really high beam knuckle lights, like the super high beam ones uh, on my hands. And I have one of those Knox gear things that lights up like my whole chest, 360 degrees. And I, I wear bright colors. I wear places where I know the streets are lit and I don't wear headphones and I, and I am not shaming people who wear headphones. I like people have different levels of feeling safe with that. I just, it freaks me out to not be able to hear a hundred percent of everything around me all the time. So that's just, and, and that is partly because I really like running in the dark. I really like running in the dark at this point because yeah. the, the last thing that I wear, and this is something that NK recommended, I have like a wrist alarm that I strap to my wrist that if you pull the little cord, it makes a really, 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 really loud noise. And don't feel comfortable running with mace or pepper spray because mm -hmm. I don't trust myself to be able to use it safely and not hurt myself in the process. But I have read that this is actually just as effective in terms of like getting someone to get away from you if you don't feel safe. And I've never had to use it. I've never had to use it. I feel at this point really safe running in Cambridge and Somerville and even Boston. And, you know, I like don't don't tell my parents the areas that I run in because my stepmom would be like, ah! <laughs> and I just like don't need her stress in my head about it. So I kind of like keep that to myself a little bit. And I don't put myself in situations that are reckless. I run in places where I personally feel safe. And there are places where I personally do not feel safe mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And I just do not run there and I don't question it. I just don't do it. So I hope that's for helpful. me. I run in the rich people neighborhoods. I think I've talked about that before. There are two uh, yeah. big neighborhoods in Denver. And by big, I mean like you can run a mile in each direction with uh, with no stoplights. And and it's wow. kind of an amazing thing. So I, whenever I do that, I always have a buddy. And it's not near my house. I have to drive to get there. It's not like hugely far. It's like a 10 or 15 minute drive. We plan it in advance. We meet, we go. We both are also really well lit. Those are kind of our strategies of doing it. The irony of like when I refer to the rich people areas, um, and I have, I have very good friends that live there. So if you're watching this for some reason, don't get mad at me. They don't like, they have this thing called light pollution where they don't want so many street lights that you can't see the stars. So the further back you go, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. you don't have, really don't, me. right? When you're like, you're on my street lights so I can run outside, please. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but that, but so when you're on the main roads to get to, to these neighborhoods, they're very well lit. But once you take a detour to keep going, you need to bring your own lights. But the tra again, the trade off that makes me feel safer is like knowing because you see it on the news the few times somebody's like dumb enough to try to go like breaking into rich people houses because they have, they have legit security. They oh, yeah. also have like oh, security. cameras where they're like, have you seen this person? Call Channel 9 News. It's like, oh my gosh. You saw that? This person was caught on the long range night vision camera three, three quarters of a mile away. This per And I'm like, so this person was like watching the footage, could be seen on the camera, had the long range, saw the news, called the police crime stoppers. Whoa, I'm running in that neighborhood. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> seriously. So there's, it's, it's not perfect that to, to others, they, they see very different logic there. Like that neighborhood got burgled. I'm like, yeah, that guy got caught. Did you <laughs> see like all the things around it? That is where I'm running. So either the well-lit uh, out, outskirt of the neighborhood, which is banded by a high wall, retaining walls with lights or in the neighborhood with the night security cameras. So it might not be like running out your door, but hopefully we can find something near that, that makes you feel safe. And I just put a link in the Facebook group. It'll be in the show notes of the podcast as well. When I say I'm lit up by like a Christmas tree, there are three things I'm wearing and it's extreme. I'm wearing my uh, rechargeable knuckle light 
lights. Those are bright. They are brighter yeah. than the regular knuckle than my regular knuckle lights. I have both yep. sets. Yeah. Um, I'm also wearing the very first thing on the list, the Petzl Now uh, NAO Plus. I have an older version of it. It's not quite as bright, but th- I mean, I'm not outdoors enough that I can justify, or at, at early enough that I can justify upgrading to the new one. But it's it. You can charge it via USB, which is awesome and very convenient for me because I can ha- leave like one of those big charging stations in my car and not have to charge that for months at a time. It's great. And the third one I have is the Kogala, which has incredibly long, like you, ch- I charge it like once a month and it's always ready to go. So that is, uh, either if I don't need all three, um, and it's a heavy to wear all three. So I don't wear all three for very long. I might wear it for like the first hour of a run and then have to double back to my car and take off the Kogala, which in and of itself isn't heavy, but it's like when the sun is gone, you probably need all three. Once, once the sun comes up, you don't need any. So plan for that too. Don't just yeah. plan to have light plan to dispose of, or at least discard Mm -hmm. the light producing objects because they, they add bulk and they add weight. They're heavy. Yeah. And then now it's great, but there is no comfortable headlamp that produces the same amount of light as the now. Yeah. And I just added a link also to the Tracer 360, which is the Knox gear vest that I run with. And I actually, I just turn it off when it's um, light enough that I don't need it anymore. And it is not very heavy and it's very comfortable to wear for an entire long run. I wore it for my close to three hour run on Friday and I only actually had it turned on for about the first hour and it didn't really bother me. So and maybe yeah. everything you said doesn't resonate because you're like, I'm not worried about not being seen. Then right. think about whatever it is that does make you nervous and try to mitigate it. Every police department all over the country like they have funding and they have to put on free self-defense classes for women uh, Denver, Denver does locally go take a self-defense class it's not perfect but it's better than nothing and then practice until some of the stuff that you learned is instinctual that could be really good so find what it is that you're afraid that you can't do or that could happen and try to slowly claw back at least a little bit of your control or find a place where you could exert the maximum amount of control and hopefully some of the strategies that we just discussed will get you there yay all right I think I can answer the last question too if you want to read it to me and then, oh my God, we're done. Woo! Yay! Woo! Hey, Coach MK and the amazing Coach Sarah. <gasps> can Hi. You- can you give some suggestions on how to transition a bit more gently from rebuild to maintain? I started out in maintain and that was too much. So I stepped over to rebuild. I have the plans for both on my training peaks calendar. And when I, for example, compare the Monday workouts, I feel like it is too big of a jump. I'm ready to do more than rebuild, but maintain seems too much. What do you recommend? Thank you. Hi. Yay. I, first of all, I just, I give you so, so much credit for being like, Hey, you know what? This is too much. I'm going to go over to rebuild. That is exactly the way we want you to think about this. Totally. And you're, you're doing amazing. So yay you, yay for like framing this. And I think a really, really good way. And yeah, it is. So it depends on where you are in rebuild. If you've been doing lane one of rebuild, then yeah, I would say going from lane one of rebuild to maintain is too big of a jump. And I would say, why not do a month in lane two of rebuild and then see how you feel. If you are currently in lane two of rebuild and you've done a month in lane two, and that feels like not enough, but maintain feels like too much, then I agree. The Monday workouts every other Monday we have some sort of a, an interval based workout in, in maintain the Monday workouts are, are hard. So do easy effort instead. We do this a lot in maintain. We talk about it constantly. If you don't want to do the Monday or Wednesday workouts for whatever reason, we don't need to know your reasons. We're happy to hear them. Yeah. You, you do not have to explain yourself. Just don't do them. Just do avocado toast instead. Either that or a stride sandwich, which is easy effort for the amount of time that the workout is supposed to be. So usually that's an hour or somewhere around there with strides, either in the middle, that's a stride sandwich or strides at the end. That's avocado toast. Okay. You never, ever, ever have to go harder than that. So I think that is a really good way to smooth the way from rebuild lane two to maintain. Also, if the long runs on maintain seem like they get too long, then start where you're at and build from there. Unless you are, you know, if you're if you're looking to like run a marathon in a few months, then yes, we're asking you to do the long runs and maintain as written. But if you're coming over from rebuild, I'm guessing that you're not like, you know, gunning for a marathon in the next couple of months. And that's good. That means we have time. It means we can do what's best for you. And we can meet you where you're at. So if your long run in rebuild is currently 75 minutes, I think 
95 minutes, which is the week one long run, I think every month and maintain. I think 95 minutes sounds like a reasonable thing to aim for, but don't worry about it if you don't quite get there. If you land somewhere between 75 and 95, cool. And you can repeat week one of maintain every single week of the month. You do not have to let the long runs get longer. You don't have to let you know the, the Friday stride sandwiches get longer. Those are the only two runs that get longer over the course of the month. Just do week one of maintain every week of the month and then see where you are at the end of the month. And maybe you'll feel like continuing to do that. And maybe you'll feel like doing maintain the length of the workouts and maintain as written the following month. There, there are a lot of different ways to slice and dice it and make it work for you and still be like really following the plan and getting the benefits. One of the things I wanted in fitness protection was that it would be very easy to swap back and forth from one plan to the next. I mean, if you bite off more than you can chew, great. You don't have to choke and you don't have to throw your money away. They all cost the same. You just move over here, try that out, come back over here. The difference between week four of lane two of rebuild and week one of maintain is tiny. The difference between week four lane two of rebuild and week four of maintain is huge. You do not need to be ready to run week four of maintain to get in to maintain. You just need to finish a solid month at least in rebuild lane two and be like, I really need more work than that. Then jump into maintain. You were looking at this exactly the way I want you to. And that's how I know that you're going to get the results that you're after exactly. this time when you might not have in the past. Cause is that because you were, you were coach, you were loved, you were making good choices and that ended up so winning life. That was such a great question to end on. That question makes me so happy. It makes me feel like this is really working and, you know, people get it. Like this person really gets it. And then that makes me super happy. Yay, you. I'm so excited for you. Yay, maintain. Or another month of lane two rebuild, like whatever. You've been in both groups. You've been a great presence in both groups. And and like, I love you wherever you are. So like, just just keep doing your thing. I mean, we love everybody wherever they are. But if you have air conditioning at night, you are more loved than I am. So, oh my god, if you first hate me right for you. now, I feel so in bad my yard. For you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, we'll come pee in your yard for you. <laughs> I, I have people for that. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you, everyone. Sorry we ran long, but we're kind of not sorry at all. We're just saying that because this is more uh, that whenever we talk a little bit more, that's more that our poor editor is doing for free. If you like the podcast, please take a minute to give us a five star rating on iTunes. And words mean more than we could possibly express here in iTunes. So if you don't just give us stars, but if you do give us stars, it's amazing. If you could also take a minute or two to write words in there about what it is you like, that might help other people find us. And that really helps us grow. If there's something you don't like or really want us to do differently, we beg you to say that privately and give us a chance to fix it if we have uh, if anything here needs to be fixed. We are young, we are new, we are nimble, we are growing and we just beg that you you there are a lot of trolls out there, please y'all. There are people saying mean things to us all the time. Just be be the big bright shining light that we need. Give us constructive criticism privately and praise publicly just like we do here. You guys are all amazing. I love you. All right, bye everyone. Thanks again. Bye everyone. 